second presentation comes from Michael G. Pratt. Dr. Pratt is the O'Connor Family Professor in the Carroll School of Management at Boston College. Mike's research is problem-centered and process-oriented and has broadly examined how people connect with the work that they do, as well as to the organizations, professions, occupations, and other collectives in which they find themselves. In addition to numerous academic publications, Mike's research has been featured in the MIT Sloan Management Review, the Boston Globe, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, Time Magazine, Forbes, and he recently appeared on Here and Now on NPR. He's also the lead editor on a forthcoming book, The Handbook of Organizational Identity, and is currently an associate editor at the Administrative Science Quarterly. So Mike, help us focus on this management question maybe in some more detail. We've talked about some esoteric, uh, the esoteric meaning of meaning uh, and meaningfulness, uh, but what are the problems, the practices, and the pitfalls that organizations encounter when trying to actually foster meaningfulness at work? So just to start out in terms of what we mean by meaningfulness, just to get that off, maybe not off the table for me, maybe mm -hmm. not for anyone else. <laughs> um, so when we talk about meaningfulness, we really talk about something that has positive significance. It really, why is work worth doing? Um, any, any work can have any kind of meaning. It could be positive, it could be negative, it could be value neutral. But when we talk about something that's meaningful, it's worth doing. It's purposeful, it's significant. I have a friend of mine who was a Arthur Anderson consultant who ended up leaving his, he was engaged and he was on the management track, left it all to become a priest. I talked to him three years after his decision. I said, say, Luke, are you happy? He goes, no, but I'm content. And I think that gets to the difference between happiness and when we talk about meaningful, it's really something more eudaimonic, something that's about being content at a kind of a very deep level. So how do we actually then, how do, so why, do, why is this a problem in organizations? Well, you, you mentioned one of them, and actually so did Frank. Um, one problem for meaningfulness is that since the Industrial Revolution, some of our jobs at least have become so fragmented. I'm doing, I'm putting on the foot pads of a chair rather than making the entire chair themselves. And as we start to divide our work, we start to see ourselves as a cog in a bigger machine, well, then alienation happens. So alienation is a huge, for many people's work, it's a huge barrier to meaningfulness. But we even find that people, you know, if, you, if you read the popular press, we have people who are professionals, lawyers, doctors, managers, who by any, any definition have work that should be enriched and meaningful, don't find any meaningfulness in it at all. And why is that? And so there's, there's a second problem of meaningfulness. We, uh, anime, so we, there, there, we don't really sometimes know what makes work meaningful. So I, the example I give is that sometimes I will come home at the end of the day, I have three kids, and one of my kids will say, Dad, you have a good day? And I have to think about that. It, not because, it, because, you know, let's see, I put out a bunch of fires, uh, I made sure things happened, I, there were a couple of emergencies I took care of, and somehow it filled up my entire day. I didn't make anything, I didn't write anything. I may not have taught a class that day, so it's, it's hard for me to know well, what makes work, what makes my work worth doing? What, what, was, what was good about it? So that's, that's because we don't have something, we don't have standards about uh, values about what makes work meaningful. So the promise is for what can work, what can organizations do to kind of, what, what are the benefits of meaningful work? Now Frank talked about some of them. He talked about engagement, that's certainly one of them. Job satisfaction. Some people talk about physiological benefits of meaningful work. And I wanted to say a couple, just a couple words about trust. Because, and Bill read in my intro, my work is very problem focused. So I had gone into a group to study a group of firefighters. And my, and my question for them, I, mean, I was really interested in how do they make decisions? How do they make, how do they make intuitive decisions, quick, accurate decisions? As I started working with them for a while, and I've, I've been now working with them for several years, um, that wasn't their problem. Their problem really was who do I trust in a fire? Who do I trust that if I go into a fire and I fall, will somebody be there to drag me out? And I said, well, don't you just see how they behave at fires? And they said, well, no, Mike, that's, the problem is less than, you know, we hardly fight any fires. Statistically, less than 5% of calls that come to a fire station are fire related. And so I, then I started to figure, well, how do they figure out how to trust people? And what, this is how I got interested in meaningful work, is because what they, what they did is they all, had a, they all had a kind of an orientation towards work. Here's how I see work. 
and you could either be a paycheck guy, and that's, that's the clean language for that one. People work simply because <laughs> they, they want to get paid. There are the book smart people. There are the, you know, these are the college edu educated people who come in, test well, and become my lieutenant. They have no practical skills. Then there's a spark. A spark are people who are super into being a firefighter. They have the scanners. They, um, they have a, I don't know if any of you remember Backdraft, the movie about firefighters. They have a Backdraft ringtone. Yeah. Um, they take vacation by hanging out with other firefighters. And these people are really into <coughs> it. They're not, they are only somewhat trusted by other firefighters. And the people that they trust most are the workers. These are people who are quiet and just do their job. And it got me thinking about, wow, I mean, that was really important to them. And so it wasn't just important about how they saw their work and how they found it meaningful. How did somebody else did? And by figuring out how is somebody else oriented themselves towards work, they knew whether to trust them or not. So meaningful work and trust were incredibly tied together. And that's what got me interested in it. Um, so these are all things that organizations, the promise, like I said, trust, job satisfaction, increased motivation, engagement at work, all these things can happen. How do organizations do it? If it's a problem of alienation, we talk about job enrichment. So if I have a boring, dull job, I may give you more tasks to do. I may give you a, a bigger piece of the job to do. I may talk about how your job is significant for the organization or society. I can give you more autonomy or I can give you more feedback. That's in a nutshell what. And more recently, uh, Adam Grant has done some work on relational job design. So if I can talk to people about how what I do benefits, if I can see the beneficiaries, it's very motivating. And um, Frank mentioned janitors. There's a, there's a, there's a research done by uh, Jane Dunn, Amy Rizneski, and others at University of Michigan on job crafting. And, in the, and their population is, is janitors at, or, or wait, at cleaning staff at a hospital. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and what they said, that they didn't have somebody, a management trying to make their job more enriched. They just did it themselves. And part of the way they do it is through customer, uh, for, from interactions with patients. So that's a whole set of things they can do, what organizations could do. The other, th the other way to, to combat meaningfulness is we need to have better stories. We'd have better accounts for why we do what we do. In society, we find there's at least six of them. I work because of a, it's a job. I make a paycheck to do something else outside of work. I work because it's a career, because I want to advance. Those are both very self-centered, I mean, focused <clears throat> towards the self. I can work because it helps other people, and there's two orientations there. One is kinship. I work to help the people I work with. Uh, soldiers, firefighters are very kinship-oriented, or service. I work in some kind of higher purpose. Some people call it a calling. Um, if we have time, I'll tell you why we don't use calling. But, um, but those are all different ways we could think about how the work we do is, what, what purpose does it be? Why is it worth doing? And the last question you asked, I'm just kind of giving you kind of a brief overview, are what are the pitfalls? Um, I, think they are, I think the biggest pitfall with any time we try to manage meaning is to do it authentically, and to do it for the right reasons. Um, and I think, we, I think we tend to think of the real, like, crass examples of, like, well, organizations say they want to help the environment, but they're greenwashing. And there's certainly some deliberate deception that goes on, but sometimes it's not quite so straightforward. So I had a, I was a, board president of a, a not-for-profit, and one of the things that we did at the not-for-profit was to help artisans in developing countries sell their products at a fair wage to people in the U.S. Fantastic mission, very noble, except they didn't pay the manager much money, and they didn't offer her health insurance. And I said, well, why, you know, why is that? Well, you know, we're trying to help these artisans over here in these other countries, so, and, and, you know, her spouse can pay for the health insurance. And I said, well, is it right to take advantage of our own people to help other people? So sometimes in the service of helping others, we sometimes neglect our own employees. So that's another pitfall.